Good afternoon. It's uh, a Tuesday, as I understand. It's and Tuesday. And today we're really glad to welcome Adam Bodnar, who is the former ombudsman uh, for Poland, uh, as well as many, many human rights uh, awards, and uh, a professor at the SWPS University, as well as uh, a lawyer uh, previously. So you have really a portfolio and uh, my question is where human rights something that when did it develop really this interest was it also to do with the regime change or maybe it was already beforehand uh, I'm just thinking about this portfolio uh, <laughs> because you know it sounds like you know I'm have almost like a portfolio of investments uh, and, uh, and simply I do my job as much as I can uh, because I started as an uh, academic, as a um, doctoral student at Warsaw University. I was working yeah. for the law firm and you know when I was working for the law firm we were talking a lot about portfolio uh, of shares in different uh, companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, coming to, to, uh, to the topic of our conversation you know, of course, the official uh, interpretation uh, when all it started is the Second World War uh, and the mm, origins of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the whole concept of human rights emerged. Uh, I think be the, the major difference is that before the individual was to great extent at the mercy of a state in which he, was, he or she was living. Um, so, for example, if we follow in developments in different parts of the world before the Second World War, we do not see this uh, concept of a uh, dignity that should be associated with every human being. We rather see the concept of citizen or other people that are residing in a territory in a given state and the state is um, empowering the citizen with certain rights or at least it is a part of the social contract of having those uh, those rights, those rights, and we have different concept and different approach in in the United States and uh, and this Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo tradition and the different approach in the continental uh, Europe. But uh, but in my opinion, when we are thinking like really seriously about human rights, how we interpret them today, uh, for me the the most important moment in our history is not so much even 48 but rather 70s mm -hmm. because in 70s we start to experience the moment of using uh, rights in order to uh, enforce them before courts or before international institutions so there is such a concept of so-called rights revolution uh, of course in the united states it was a little bit earlier with this famous saga and case law concerning uh, ending the racial segregation in schools but in Europe, you know, if we look, uh, you know, first judgments of the ECHR appeared uh, as late as 70s, 80s, uh, thanks to mostly to, to uh, English lawyers. And then we see emergence of serious uh, non-governmental organizations. We see the adoption of the final act of the um, Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. We see emergence of Helsinki committees throughout Europe. Uh, and I think that uh, those rights, because people may start to enforce them using their uh, legal uh, and political capabilities, uh, they start to be closer to every individual. Mm -hmm. and would you say this, uh, just a, a small yeah, question, sure. would you say that this uh, understanding of this human uh, security and, and this entitlement of rights for this individual, does it uh, differ between Europe and the US? For sure it differs because, uh, in my opinion, it's quite interesting that even when we are talking to uh, American lawyers, uh, when you start to mention such things like uh, basic rights or fundamental rights, they don't really get it what you are meaning. Uh, when you are talking about human rights, it is for them more something like the general concept, ideology, uh, something for which you are fighting uh, abroad because you want to protect those uh, human rights uh, and what they what is the most important for them are so-called civil liberties so uh, uh, civil liberties which means that all those uh, freedoms that are associated with your uh, personal statutes but also with your participation in a uh, in a political process and moreover uh, for us in Europe such issues like the prohibition of the death penalty 
is such an obvious thing, uh, at least for those people who are uh, believing in the concept of human rights. Well, uh, in the United States, the death penalty is is used uh, still, and there is no even a serious discussion about the abolition of the death penalty throughout the whole uh, country. Of course, there are dis discussions about some states or about maybe limitation of the use of the death penalty, but, but as a concept, it is not against uh, human rights or civil liberties in the American legal discourse. I, I, I wanted to ask you regarding, as you are a Polish uh, citizen, um, how do you look as human rights activists and a Polish citizen altogether one person, what's going on in Poland rega regarding the rule of law? Because as I understand, you also experienced what's happening from within uh, regarding your position and how the whole situation uh, developed. How do you look at it? Uh, what can be done? And uh, how, lo how long it will take uh, to maybe shift Poland into more human rights pro um, course? It's one of the most uh, difficult questions uh, that was asked uh, in the recent weeks or months to me. Mm, because, you know, I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, I don't know how much time it will take. I don't know whether we have any chance of unwrapping those changes. Uh, uh, and there were uh, so many things destroyed, spoiled, uh, that uh, repairing this may require even a generation. Uh, I think that uh, when we are talking about the rule of law situation, we should, uh, and especially coming from the Central and Eastern Europe, we should think about the problem, what went wrong, so why we have this crisis. And in my opinion, it is the uh, reason of three factors. It is the consequence of three factors. The first factor is simply low efficiency of courts, that they were uh, not uh, appreciated enough in terms of reforming and providing their uh, proper effective functioning in a democracy for years. The second problem is the lack of civic awareness. Why uh, independent and impartial courts are needed for the development of the country and development of the economy, for the stability of the whole country. And I think the third point is, uh, in my opinion, that uh, we see the rise of the use of the social media. And at the same time, when such institutions like courts are attacked or are criticized, they do not have remedies and methods trained how to respond. And, and basically, in my opinion, the Polish government, at least, used those three elements in order to challenge courts and in order to uh, achieve a significant change in terms of division of powers, in order to deinstall any method of external control over governmental activities. And at the same time, it took advantage of all those social processes, like the development of social media that were uh, taking place, or dissatisfaction with the court's uh, performance. Uh, and that's why it is so difficult to fight against this, uh, because uh, when you are talking about such quite abstract value that courts are, should be, uh, that courts should be independent, many people do not understand what are you really talking about, because they don't have this daily experience of not even dealing with courts, but also feeling what does it mean that you do not have independent judicial system, that this whole process of changes is developing over months and, uh, uh, and years. And and that is also the reason why the European Union is having such a problem, because although the European Union is using all different mechanisms in order to stop the process of destruction of the Polish ju judiciary, uh, you cannot at the end of the day do it without uh, the involvement of local actors, without the uh, electorate in a given country that would also fight for the same um, values. So all of this is very much complex and you know I hope that maybe we'll be able to get out of this trouble, but uh, I don't know how much time it will take. And um, how do you think, is EU actually doing everything it, it can? Or during the situation of COVID, when it was the main priority, and also now the situation with Ukraine, the Polish uh, 
rule of law question is set aside because the priorities are different and so the whole situation and the possibility to address this question is now prolonged and it may take even longer for it to be dealt with. I remember that uh, more or less uh, in May, June 2021, I was very critical towards the position of the European Union. So I had a feeling that European Union is simply not doing enough. And even I've made a statement uh, calling on Ursula von der Leyen that maybe she should step up and do something more. And I was really frustrated because it was the moment when uh, the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court was going to adjudicate whether Judge Tuleya, the most famous Polish uh, judge, was going to be not just suspended as a judge, but also put into the handcuffs in order to be brought in front of the prosecutor. And the disciplinary chamber was basically discussing whether you may use coercive measures with respect to Judge uh, Tuleya. And I thought that, you know, I was standing with Judge Tuleya in front of the Supreme Court, showing him solidarity, and I thought, come on, you know, we are in the middle of Europe, and we are observing things that, you know, may happen maybe in some African countries uh, that are not democratic, that are not part of such a, a supranational organization like the European Union. And, and I was quite frustrated with the position of the Commission. But later on, if we look, if we look carefully, what do we see? We see judgments uh, of the Court of Justice about uh, elimination, liquidation of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. We see penalties imposed, heavy penalties imposed by the Court of Justice, one million euro uh, per day uh, for non-implementation of, of judgments of the, of the Court of Justice. We see also the suspension of the recovery fund to Poland. And finally, we see the mm, uh, final judgment of the Court of Justice concerning conditionality regulations. So this is this regulation saying money for, uh, for rule of law or money for the respect to European uh, values. And here in this case, the Commission is playing a good uh, card, uh, claiming that any argument by the Polish or Hungarian government are simply wrong. Uh, and moreover, in addition to all of this, we see that uh, Libe Committee is active, European Parliament is adopting uh, resolutions, uh, as well as uh, we have two uh, reports on the rule of law prepared by Didier Reinders, the uh, uh, commissioner responsible for the justice and rule of law section in the European Commission. So you know, so you have all those different achievements, both political and legal, and still it does not work. So still Poland is ready to say, sorry, we are not going to make anything and we are not concerned with the fact that billions of euros are suspended to us from the recovery fund. We are going to get deeper and deeper into political discussions with our coalition partners, but will not do what is needed uh, for Poland. So in such a situation, it is not the question whether the Commission is doing enough because it seems Commission cannot do more at this stage. But the question is to when Polish authorities will realize that they are just selling the Poland's future for the sake of some political uh, coalitions and political uh, battles. Um, so, so here I see, uh, see the problem, not within the European Commission, but rather with in the reaction of the Polish uh, government that is still trying to play in some other game than the European integration. We see, yes, these mechanisms are there, uh, but still, these uh, regimes, they are there also. The sovereign, the people have voted. Yes, they have may, may there may be some uh, social engineering in, in the process of all of, the, of their terms, but, but uh, generally there are real people that go to the ballots. And what, yeah. this is something that we see uh, well recently in uh, Hungary. Fidesz still has a really strong position. So uh, how do you respond? Uh, should, shouldn't there be some, well, what is just the interlink and the interplay between politics and human rights in your situation? To what extent can really they be interpreted? Or are there something codified already in the, you know, the basic uh, documents such as the United Nations Charter or the ICCPR? Mm -hmm. Of course, human rights are codified in international human rights treaties, but they are codified also in constitutions. Uh, and because they are in the constitution, they should be respected. 
Um, and the problem is that uh, it is relatively easy, uh, the Polish example proved this, to, uh, mm, to destabilize uh, or to uh, minimize the impact uh, of the judicial review institutions like the Constitutional Court. And it is also possible to uh, impede the process of the direct applicability of the constitutional norms by the by Polish uh, common courts. So, uh, using all different means, uh, public authorities, the executive power, may try to restrict the real daily applicability of human rights in the context of the daily operation of the state power, but also in the context of adoption of different laws. Uh, so what to do with this? Uh, I think that that is the process that we should uh, understand that is happening. And in such a situation, we should think strongly what other methods shall we use mm -hmm. in order to achieve uh, some similar purpose. So for example, if I see that the legislation is uh, obviously or manifestly uh, contrary to the constitutional standard, I shouldn't wait for the last stage, which could be the potential judicial review of this legislation, because I know that uh, simply uh, uh, cards are marked uh, and you cannot, uh, you, can quite, uh, you can quite easily predict the result of the uh, adjudication by the Constitutional Court, but rather I should do whatever it is possible before in order to attract the interest of the public opinion into this issue. So I should use freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, uh, right to petition, access to information in order, in order to show that there is something wrong with, uh, with, the, with the given piece of legislation. The problem, the, the question is whether I will have time for this, whether I will have uh, energy, whether the civil society is strong enough in order to uh, protest against this. So, so in my opinion, uh, in the previous system, to a great extent, we had a organ that was playing a role a little bit of the fire guard. So uh, that's how I treat the Constitutional Court, that at a certain point the fire guard brigade was coming, justices of the Constitutional Court, and they were, um, and they were uh, putting out the fire. Putting out the fire. Yeah. Right now uh, the role has changed because it is the whole society that is responsible for this. Uh, it is the opposition, the parliamentary opposition, that should voice concern earlier. But uh, even if we are aware of this, it may happen that we will not have enough of energy, time, and imagination. Uh, how shall we protest against the, those uh, those changes? And this government is just waiting for this, uh, to uh, for the situation when some new laws will be adopted without any big troubles, without any uh, any hurdles. Uh, but but I think that. Uh, Still, in the society, there is a need of seeking for some proportional solutions and not solutions that are just serving the, uh, the one political uh, party. Moreover, in the Polish system, what we see is that there are some new players on the ground that try to play this role of, let's say, balancing mm -hmm. uh, the, mm, the potential of the executive uh, power and the legislative majority in the parliament. And such such institution, such person, is the Polish president. Quite interestingly, Polish president uh, recently vetoed two laws uh, that were of high value for the ruling party, but still he decided to, to, to do this. And, you know, it gives you a, some hope that still there is some level of pluralism in the public debate. Uh, regarding hope, uh, Clerk, we, in many situations, unfortunately, of course, po in the context of, of Europe, uh, Poland's name comes maybe uh, f with a negative kind of a light, but but still, nevertheless, you as the as the ombudsman, you have seen maybe some progress. And what have been these specific areas where maybe most Europeans would not know that Poland has in, uh, improved in that mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, for sure, between 2015 and 2020, 21, we had a huge decline in terms of protecting civil and political rights, uh, especially women's rights, LGBT plus rights, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of the 
uh, freedom of uh, mm, of association. Uh, we have also declined in terms of the right to court and protection of uh, property. But interestingly, uh, in the same time, uh, the government has made a couple of important reforms that created much more egalitarian society. So the distribution of social funds was really fundamental uh, in order to increase the average level of uh, living and spending of uh, regular households. Uh, moreover, there was a lot of support to elderly people or to uh, people, to the working class, to the, uh, because of the um, more uh, intrusive practices of the labor inspectorate. The labor inspectorate is much more diligent in terms of dealing with uh, individual um, uh, cases. So, uh, so that, that is a little bit like a paradox, that on the other one hand you see a decline in terms of classical first generation rights, and you see some growth in terms of classical second generation rights, especially uh, rights uh, to social security, labor rights, or, uh, or um, getting people out of extreme uh, poverty. Uh, the, but how the, the problem is how to reconcile one with the other. Uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the major problems is that uh, the government, even if it invests a lot of money into the social programs, these are massive scale programs. Like you provide a special family benefit to every family that has kids, which is great. But at the same time, you do not have money for investing into the higher quality of education or health services or uh, fighting with some mental health problems. Uh, so, in my opinion, the level of more sophisticated public policies was decreased uh, uh, during those, uh, uh, those years. But, but, but when we understand this, we see what could be a potential chance for the future Polish opposition. Because in my opinion, the opposition should not concentrate just on such issues like rule of law, uh, constitution, but it should also concentrate on uh, different issues of social protection uh, and social um, security. That, that is one of the major uh, that is one of the major challenges for the opposition, how to do it effectively. How do you see the future of Poland in terms of uh, European Union as we see that uh, UK leaves uh, EU and what may be the strategy of European Union regards Poland whether it will try to deal with the situation uh, calmly and not threatening or doing anything um, very left-handed, so to say, that uh, pushes the Poland out of EU because at that point uh, EU loses its power even more. And um, how do you see the situation in general? And, and in addition to that, would you say that this position has changed vis-a-vis -vis the actions in Ukraine? I think this is a fundamental change uh, because uh, due to the war in Ukraine, uh, I think the principle is that all hands on the deck and that the whole liberal world should protect each other uh, and protect the ter territory of the European Union member states, uh, should get into a strong coalition with the United States. Uh, uh, and moreover, uh, this strong position in the, of Poland in this coalition is in the interest of such countries like Germany, France, Spain, Italy and so on. Uh, as well, it is in the interest of uh, the United States. What is the risk. The risk is that because Poland is playing an important role in a security discussion, uh, partners, international partners, might be m much more apologetic uh, towards Poland than any, any time before. So if Poland is violating, you know, here and there human rights uh, or rule of law principles, maybe, you know, it will not be uh, Mm, it will not be any political cost for Poland uh, from its international partners. So international partners will not even make questions, ask questions, because 
they will see that you know Poland is performing important security role. So basically, we should close our eyes to some uh, like some violations. A little bit like this, although I hope that still you know we will not end up in a country where lawyers, judges, and prosecutors are basically jailed. Uh, I hope that still yeah. we are uh, in a different moment. Uh, but 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 that is the trend. That that could be the trend of uh, of thinking about um, Poland and and the same with Hungary. I think that uh, even if Viktor Orban is saying such brutal words towards European Union, towards Zelensky, uh, towards those international media and elites, I think that at the end of the day there will be no pressure about putting some more uh, sanctions on Orban uh, or on uh, trying to ex exclude him somehow from a club. Uh, I think that the whole situation will go into the way of accommodating that kind of problematic countries. Uh, still, uh, I think we shouldn't expect that the change will come just from the top, so from the European Union to to Poland, but the change should come from inside. So it should be a result of the internal forces that are fighting, fighting for those, uh, for those values. And and uh, quite paradoxically, it appears that uh, war in Ukraine showed the potential of the Polish civil society. Please note that more than one million refugees has been accepted into the territory of Poland, and we didn't have any special shelters uh, or camps for refugees. And the Polish civil society showed tremendous uh, support to, uh, to refugees. So the question is whether it is also a sign that the civil society that is interested in protecting those ba basic values is so strong that, uh, that it uh, gives a, um, a chance and for the better future of, uh, of Poland. It's really funny, yeah. That's really interesting, ironic, how the attitude of the well, Polish people have changed uh, since 2014, and and in a sense, this crisis maybe will um, spark this kind of uh, interest in, in in how to protect these civil rights. What does a refugee is, and uh, what a refugee is fle well be basically fleeing from, mm. and in that situation, I think there might be some improvement. Yes and no. Because on the one hand, you may feel that there is really like a massive solidarity mm -hmm. uh, towards refugees coming from Ukraine and Polish people should be acclaimed for this, what they did and what they are still doing. You know, this moment when we are hearing that, you know, number of people is accepting refugees into their homes, into their private flats uh, or just organizing transport to the border, making, you know, all different kinds of charity actions. That was really something like the festival of the civil society, you know, between, uh, let's say, 24th of February and the end of March uh, 2022. Of course, with the lapse of the time, but everybody predicted this, this energy started to fade away a little bit, but it does not mean that, you know, anybody is left alone in Poland. You know, people, uh, Ukrainian refugees are, uh, are protected. Uh, and for sure, uh, when you compare the situation to 2014-15, especially 2015 when the Law and Justice uh, Party came to power, uh, that is a completely different approach because in 2015, uh, Law and Justice government said that they are not going to accept any refugees whatsoever. They don't want to participate in any relocation quotas and the relocation schemes. Uh, moreover, I remember the time, you know, when in 2017, even later on, when uh, the Catholic Church start, started to lobby for making uh, so-called humanitarian corridors for refugees, that some groups of refugees would be transported from camps in Italy and Greece. And Polish government did not even agree to humanitarian corridors with respect to 100 people. Can you imagine? That was, uh, that was a really uh, shameful uh, experience. And, you know, I, I, as the Ombudsman, I've made all different calls and statements, but nobody w wanted to to listen. But please look that even if we are talking in a positive way about this development uh, concerning Ukrainian refugees, please note that at the same time we have a very difficult situation at the Belarusian Polish border. So still there is so-called uh, state of 
exceptionality emergency there. It is not the official constitutional state of emergency, but basically the legislation that has been adopted is very much similar to the state of emergency. Uh, there is a three uh, kilometers wide strip of land uh, where regular people do not have access. So uh, neither NGO leaders, activists, nor medics, nor just uh, anybody external is not having access to the zone. And moreover, authorities are still using pushback practices there. So, so, th so that is a paradox that on the one hand, the Ukraine and Polish border is very much open and the uh, Belarusian Polish border is closed. Why? Because uh, simply those refugees to great extent look differently. So there is an accusation of racism and that depending on who are those refugees, the approach of the Polish authorities might uh, might uh, differ. So I wouldn't say that everything is so nice in, in Poland. Of course, uh, there was an important change uh, in, the, in the behavior of the Polish civil society. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that there was such a big change in the approach of the government. What's your opinion regarding uh, Poland's behavior regarding Ukraine's question? Because uh, in, in social media, I think it was two or three weeks ago, when there was published that Ukraine asked uh, Poland for uh, Russian planes and uh, po Poland uh, refused to do so, it, was it because it was scared that Russia may think it was a sort of uh, position against them? Uh, was it a political decision uh, or um, it was something else? I think it was more of a premature diplomacy issue. So I think Poland was too quick in announcing the plan before it has been uh, discussed uh, and clarified with NATO partners. And uh, so simply some proposal has become public yeah. before even it was discussed within the, uh, uh, the NATO. And I think that was simply the, the mistake by the Polish diplomacy to do, the, to do it this way. Maybe if Poland would start using the secret diplomacy for days, weeks and convincing uh, partners from NATO, maybe the result would be, uh, would be different. But then it, there was no goal to great extent for, uh, for the um, for the NATO partners and especially to Americans to agree on this um, a solution. But I think that over the time we see that there is a pressure on increase, increasing the <coughs> supply of <coughs> military equipment to Ukraine. Uh, I remember that uh, still two or three weeks ago there was a talk about that uh, Poland and other countries should deliver only this so-called defensive arms, uh, like missiles, like uh, some protective uh, equipment, like uh, anti-air uh, anti uh, attack uh, systems. Uh, and right now, uh, some countries declare sending tanks uh, to, to Ukraine. And sorry, with tanks, you cannot say that they, they are just defensive weapon. So we'll see how it will go. You know, I think everything depends on the, uh, on the scale of uh, further involvement of Russia. If Russia decides to attack Donbas heavily, because that is, it seems that that is on the table, then maybe the, the policy of the of European uh, Union member states as well, as well as policy of the NATO will change regarding the delivery of weapons. Yeah, because currently we see that we see posters, everything, we stand with Ukraine, but at the same time, in the first weeks, we saw nothing else. It's just like mass people, people on the streets, somehow, yeah, fighting against Putin, but only with words. Because at that point, um, especially, um, I imagine Baltic states were very scared of what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there was no uh, involvement uh, helping it physically because, you know, asking Poland, Poland says no. And uh, we're just watching and seeing what's going to happen. Charity, though. Yeah, char Char charity. Okay, charity. At, at least charity, though, was a good, I think, response. What we can see in all of Eastern 
uh, Europe is that so people were so s well sh shared in their experiences in that sense because how many like uh, one million in one day or something like that yeah. and, and then in a few days five million for example for Lithuanians mm -hmm. and Latvians it's like wow yeah yeah charity was great uh, but please note uh, that uh, and it is even appreciated by the uh, Andrei Deszczyca, the Ukrainian ambassador to Poland, that uh, the fact that number of Ukrainian members of families, especially women and children, may go to uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe and they may feel they are protected and safe is extremely important also from the point of view of war because all the men and other people that are engaged into uh, military defense or territorial defense and in fighting, they feel that their families are secure. They don't have to take care about their uh, families because they know that uh, most of them are in Poland and Slovakia and uh, other countries. Uh, so, so I think it is not just a charity. I think it is uh, the question of creating that kind of a uh, protection, umbrella protection to uh, families that gives them, uh, gives to soldiers of Ukraine much more uh, power and uh, mm, and support in basically daily fighting. And on the other side, on a daily basis, people throughout Europe are now becoming poorer because of the en roaring energy prices. And what has been seen from the US that they are now opening their national oil reserves to you know stabilize mm -hmm. the price and uh, I just wanted to know your opinion from a human rights perspective and the social security that we, we were talking about so how do you see the uh, cost of living rising uh, impact on human rights uh, throughout Europe? Uh, I think it is too early to uh, to say how this whole situation will stabilize mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, we, we don't know what will be the, the real final in increase in uh, prices and, uh, and at what, what could be the level of the state intervention in such a situation uh, and uh, how we may transform our energy sector into the renewable energy that may produce uh, also and support a number of, uh, of families. But, but for sure, you know, the cost will be paid to the by the electorates of particular EU member states. Uh, but simply, you know, that is the cost we have to pay for freedom. That yeah. is the cost, uh, that is our moral obligation to, to do it. That and is our war. Uh, that is our war because, you know, we are not uh, suffering. It is the Ukrainian nation that is suffering. But it does not mean that the war, not only against Ukraine, but against whole Europe and the war in which we have also to participate because we impose sanctions is, w without, is coming without any cost to, uh, to us. Mm. Well, I think, I hope so as well, that economically this will stabilize. But... Um, you yeah, but but but, but yeah. and here you know I think the, the the important point is the level of responsibility of leaders, mm -hmm. because you know, Zelensky showed what does it mean to be a responsible leader. You know how to lead the nation, and I think we should expect the same from the leaders of um, EU member states as well as from the European Commission. They should be that kind of you know guides that are taking uh, the nations. Uh, through the crisis. Uh, and it could be a, a long-term crisis, you know. Uh, I had this privilege to be present uh, at the courtyard of the Royal Castle in Warsaw mm -hmm. when Joe Biden was delivering his speech. And he said quite openly, you know, it is a completely new moment of history. Uh, it is the moment that will be painful. You know, we shouldn't think that basically we'll, we'll live in the same way as we are living before because, you know, the world is once again divided. There is another iron curtain that is uh, more or less uh, on the rise. Uh, and because there is this transformational moment, uh, we'll have to pay the cost of this. But uh, we'll become stronger thanks to this, hopefully. And there is a chance that we'll be able to save uh, liberal values um, for, for us. Like for example, you know, like looking for from a little bit from a scholar perspective, I'm just you know I'm, I'm very much interested into the 
operation of the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights. And I know that for last years, the European uh, Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe have been paralyzed because of the pressure coming from Russia. Now, without Russia, there is a chance that even such organization may be much stronger than, uh, than before in terms of enforcing some of the, uh, some of the rights. So, so at all different spheres, we may see also the, mm, the resurrection, maybe, of the belief in the liberal values and the democracy, because, uh, because we see what the price could be paid when we are not taking care about those rights. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, I wanted to know your opinion. Uh, we see that, you know, Russia is being seen always as, you know, the bad guy. And, uh, because it is bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so come on, you know, but, after Bucha, uh, after Irpin, yeah. after yeah, Mariupol. But, uh, uh, I wanted to know uh, regarding the, also the distribution of uh, fake news, where is the, um, where is the line maybe where also the, so so-called um, media is uh, making everything so emotionally bad that maybe we don't see the geopolitical perspective of what's happening that the, the media is pushing so much okay russia did this russia did that but at the same time when we look and the other side says but you know, it's not like that. I mean, it's not that bad. We didn't kill those people that are in Bucha. It's uh, the other part that is the uh, Zelensky part that, which is uh, provoking it, and it's not uh, uh, like actually us behind it. So, where is the fake news coming? Is it coming only from um, the Russia side, or it's possible that also some part of fake news comes from the other side? And how to discern really in this environment of war mm -hmm. what is really you know factual? Mm -hmm. No, I would differentiate because I think that even if Ukraine is playing on some, let's say, propaganda tune from time to time and is presenting only successes and so on, you know, they are having a completely different role to fulfill. They are not here for providing like the uh, very general uh, objective information here, but they are using their techniques they are having in order to, to uh, still encourage people to fight for their country. Zelensky, whatever happens, he must pre all the time, every day, present a certain vision of the unity of the state, of Ukrainian heroes, uh, of people that are uh, fighting for the country, because this is the only way to, in my opinion, to get through this, terri this uh, horrible situation they are so they are facing using propaganda against yeah. propaganda so like uh, no it, i wouldn't say so it, it's uh, uh, i would say it is winning the is use it is not a propaganda but it is using a certain type of narrative in order to still encourage people mm -hmm. to fight for because without it they would not believe that that the war is that, that there is a value in this uh, in this fight. So I would, uh, I would rather say, great that he's doing this, this way, that they are smart enough to, to do this uh, uh, this way. I think it is not the time when we should use like typical, let's say, human rights framework in order to analyze the, the situation. Of course, we should read and, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I read different analytical reports uh, there is a very interesting public available uh, report of the Institute of the Study of War uh, associated with some American universities. Uh, there are a lot of uh, commentators producing the real uh, picture of what is uh, happening. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm not, I know that most probably there is a bigger number of tractors uh, carrying out, you know, those tanks. Uh, Ukrainian tractors than, uh, than they exist uh, in reality mm -hmm. and that they are used as a kind of a you know, uh, funny type of uh, presenting nice, uh, nice narrative. Uh, but, uh, but we should, but having said this, we should understand that Russia is making this war, this information war already for years, for it's not just a question of this moment, but you know we had the anti-vaccine 
movement, we had Brexit movement, we had uh, Trump's election and a number of uh, other, there, it is not clear to what extent Russia was interfering into Polish uh, uh, elections with some disinformation uh, uh, techniques. Uh, and, and I think that the, the major lesson for us uh, is that we shouldn't treat disinformation these days from, from such superpower like Russia as a just kind of a folk type of a thing. Uh, uh, so as something which is, that should not be um, appreciated or should be ignored or should be forgotten. But we should look at it as a simply instrument of power, as a, as a, as a weapon in a, in a war. And it means that if we treat it seriously, then we'll start to use all different uh, techniques in order to fight it back. Uh, and it is the responsibility of the democratic governments to, to do it. Um, we have seen in the past when the uh, U.S. and uh, Russia choose as a background, um, so to say, a piece of land where they fight and uh, get your, their cards straight, as it has been in Vietnam and other places. Uh, would you say that uh, Ukraine's scenario is the same, where they just uh, try to, they also choose the land and Russia is the incinerator this time, but they uh, try to get their bill straight? No, I think he, it is a completely different situation because this time it is about destruction of the Ukra Ukrainian nation and taking the territory and basically uh, recreating the Soviet empire. Uh, so this is a complete, it's not any proxy war, it is just a war for these people, for this territory, for subordination and destruction of a, a Ukrainian uh, uh, nation. So, so this is a kind of, you know, capture type of a war, occupying type of a war and not a, you know, proxy war taking place somewhere in the middle of Latin America or in Asia. But should Latvia and other Baltic states should be worried uh, that, you know, they also were part of uh, Soviet uh, um, Union? I think that I would take seriously what Joe Biden said, uh, that uh, NATO will never allow that any inch of the territory of the NATO country will be ever uh, taken or will be ever in danger. Uh, I think that was a serious declaration. And moreover, uh, I listened to one interesting commentator in Poland, uh, Piotr Łukasiewicz, who said, if you are looking into that kind of declarations, you should not just treat them th that these are words, but you should take into account also actions. And if you look into what U.S. is doing in, w within recent two months, you see that there are a lot of real actions. So there are soldiers on the ground, there is a delivery of the equipment, uh, there is a all the time support in terms of surveillance of the sky zone over Ukraine. Uh, there are sanctions. So, so, you know, so it is not that like, because sometimes there is a, it, at least in Poland, we have this comparison that, oh yeah, it is the same like it was in 1939. Poland was having a treaty with uh, France and with the UK. And then the only thing they could do was uh, sending some planes uh, that were distributing leaflets from the sky that, you know, uh, that were kind of protesting against the war, okay? Here it is not like this. It is n it, these are not just words. You know, he's coming to the, almost to the war zone, I mean Joe Biden. So before he came, he's sending Kamala Harris and Antony Blinken. And moreover, he's delivering a lot of equipment, uh, a lot of military stuff, including, uh, I think altogether there are 10,000 US troops right now in the territory of Pol Poland. Uh, mm, uh, we don't know if, even you know how much uh, military equipment is, is there, but, but it, it seems that uh, this crisis is treated seriously and I think it gives us, uh, I mean NATO member states, a feeling of, uh, of security that, uh, that Russia will not go so far, uh, and that Russia will not start uh, the war with the whole uh, uh, NATO. I mean, will not start a direct war with the NATO, with the territories of the NATO uh, member states. Maybe on a finishing note, a philosophical question: What, in your opinion, are the most crucial steps in order to fight tyranny 
either nationally or internationally. Hmm. <laughs> you know, th there are plenty of books. You know, there is this yeah. book by Timothy Stan Snyder on on, 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 on tyranny. You know, I, I like like just two lessons from this book. One lesson that was really important to me is the lesson that you should protect institutions. Yeah. That every citizen should basically think which institution is uh, sympathetic to him, her, mm -hmm. and how to protect this institution. For me, it was extremely important that when I was attacked as the Ombudsman, I always had a feeling that citizens are with me, that they are sending you know, postcards, they are making demonstrations, they are uh, showing that the institution is important to them. But the second point I would like to say is uh, raising awareness. The most important uh, civil society action I participated last year was so-called Tour, Tour de Constitution, Tour de Constitucia. It was about promotion of the Polish constitution in, in 80 Polish cities. So basically we traveled with such a big, huge role of the constitution, printed in a very fancy way, uh, and we organized in each and every city on our tour meetings devoted to the value of the uh, Constitution. So, and that is one of the many, many examples that can be done in order to promote the, uh, the value of the Constitution. And in every democratic state, I would start to think, okay, are we doing enough in order to make the Constitution, rule of law and human rights understandable, but not just to the citizens of big cities, but just to the local uh, population? Do we really know whether this farmer or this entrepreneur, this worker understands what this whole system means for him, why he may feel uh, secure, better in this uh, environment than in authoritarian country. I'm not so sure whether we are doing enough here. I think that, that uh, the more we spend on this, uh, the better investment we, we, we make into our future. Adam, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. And thank, <laughs> thank you for, you for you making this serious. Yeah, thank you that you found time to fly from Poland to meet us. <laughs> yeah. Very much appreciated. A long, and, and a long road to back, as I understand. Yeah, so. you know, Riga is close. You know, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for this. Thank you. I hope that everyone who listens will find some answers towards their questions. So thank you that you found time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>